We're few in number today. A lot of folks are out. But you're going to hear as good a message as you could hear anywhere you went today. You're going to hear it today in this place. Something that God has put in my heart and spoken to me, and I'm going to speak it to you. I've been looking at this, dealing with this all week long. And very worthwhile, very worthwhile for me. A prisoner's message. No matter what, you got to stand firm and you got to do it with joy. Philippians gives us that kind of a message today out of the book of Philippians. Philippi was an interesting city about 10 miles away from the Asian Sea. And it was named after King Philip, who was the father of Alexander the Great. Amazing. In Paul's second missionary journey, Paul, Silas, Timothy, and Luke founded the church in Philippi. A strong bond was formed between Paul and that church in Philippi. Paul visited the church twice in his third missionary journey. In his second, he founded the church, but he visited twice in his third journey. The letter was highly interpersonal. It was Christ-centered. It contained some of the most insightful things about Christ, his humility and his supreme power and honor. It stands as a New Testament letter of joy and it challenges every one of us in Christian living, in humility, servanthood, and rejoice in the Lord no matter what. Can somebody say amen to that? Yes. Yes. Paul, the apostle, was a very unique person. He was a devout Jew who became a devout believer in Jesus, Yeshua, Christ, Messiah. Father, I ask you to speak to us today. Speak to us in this message that would do something that would not only challenge us, but they would change us in a way of thinking that would bless our lives. And everybody said, stand firm. Stand fast. Be joyful in the middle of life circumstances, no matter what, was Paul's message to the Philippian believers. Press on. Yep. I've had that word come to me from the Lord and the Holy Spirit. Press on, David. You got to keep pressing on. You got to be faithful. You got to stand firm. Press on in our relationship with Christ and grow in unity, in humility, in peace, learning to stand firm and be joyful. Wow, that's a mouthful. I'll tell you what, I want to believe that God's going to call some of the Apostle Paul type in this church here. I see Richard and see Jaron and and that good looking guy there. God wants to make some, He want to, wants to make some strong warriors out of these young men. Amen. Strong warriors. Man, that would do my heart good. If I look back and saw Jaron as a mighty warrior for God, I would say it was worth my whole time being in Sanford. Amen. Yes, I believe that about you guys. Warriors. That's what the Apostle Paul was. He was a mighty warrior. And he was strong in his faith. Many people believe that the key thought in the letter that he wrote to the Philippians is the word joy. The subject of joy is certainly the subject of the book, but also the, word, the, word, the book begins and ends with stand firm. I like that in Chapter 1, verse 27, Paul said, Whatever happens,
weapons. Stand firm in the spirit. I mean, believe we can do that. Wouldn't that be powerful testimony of our lives that somebody says of us, we were faithful and we stood firm for the things of Jesus Christ. Would you want that said about you? Of course. It's interesting. In bon Paul Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress, a Mr. Christian saw a fireplace blazing with a roaring fire, but the devil was throwing buckets of water on the flame, trying to douse them out. And in the story of Pilgrim's Progress, the interpreter beckoned him through the door to the back side of the wall of the hearth. And behind the hearth, there was a man pouring a constant flow of new fresh oil on that fire and making it unquenchable. I mean, please, that God can pour in that oil of the Spirit. God has a secret supply of oil, of grace, of peace, of courage that can flood our hearts with the Holy Spirit. In the 13 letters that Paul wrote, 145 times he mentions the Holy Spirit. I mean, he wants the Holy Spirit to pour that fresh oil into your life. That grace that peace, that courage that can flood our hearts. In chapter 127, he says, whatever happens, stand firm in the Spirit. Chapter 4, verse 1, stand firm in the Lord. He gives us that admonition. Stand firm in the Spirit. Stand firm in the Lord. We must stand firm with the whole armor of God. You've got to dress right. That's one thing my father taught me way back. You've got to dress right. Dress for success. That's what he taught me. I have to tell you, my father was quite a dresser. I mean, back in the day when people actually dressed up, he, he always was dressed up. He, was, he always looked like he walked out of uh, Esquire. He, he's a dressing, dressed up man. But he also knew what it meant to dress in the spirit, dress in the whole armor of God. He was, my father was a great man of God. He was a great warrior for God. And that's why I have been so blessed in my life because of him being my father. Now, King Philip was the father of Alexander the Great. And I didn't turn out to be Alexander the Great, but boy, my father influenced my life dramatically. It was amazing. We must stand with the whole armor of God. Notice the little variation of translations I gave you in 13 through 17 of Ephesians 6. Therefore, you must wear the whole armor of God in order that you may receive power to withstand, to stand firm, and having overthrown them all, to stand unshaken, to stand your ground, buckle on the belt of truth, the breastplate of uprightness, having shod your feet with the equipment of the gospel. Above all, take the shield of faith and to put out all the fiery tipped arrows shot by the wicked. Take the helmet of salvation. Take the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. That's what you've got to be dressed proper for battle. You've got to put on the whole armor of God. If you're going to stand firm and you're going to do battle against the enemy, you got to put on the right thing. you got to put on the whole armor of God if you're going to dress for battle. Some of our great military guys and special forces and rangers, these guys go through rigorous training. I'm not sure I would have the ability to go through the things they, they go through. But they're mighty warriors. We need mighty warriors for Christ. Amen? Paul says throughout the book, stand firm. We got to stand firm in the whole armor of God. We got to stand firm in the liberty of Christ. Galatians 5:1. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm and do not let yourselves be burdened again by the yoke of slavery. He, in the book of Galatians, it just simply says, stay free. Stay free. Paul did not want anyone to dilute the teaching of the gospel. Likewise, we must be free of anything that would enslave us, including the fear of men. 
We need a core belief in historical Christianity as an indispensable biblical worldview on the burning issues of our day, says Robert Morgan. I like his writings, and I use a lot of his commentary. We need a core belief in traditional historic Christianity, an indispensable biblical worldview on the burning issues of our day. How many know that we have a lot of burning issues of our day? In our culture, and the world today, we must stand firm concerning those unbiblical issues that have cursed our present generation. We see it played out on the news this week in the last couple of weeks. While godless, useful idiots were regurgitating their hatred of Israel, University of Tennessee had thousands lifting their hands and worshiping God at the same time of what was going on at Harvard, the same thing that was going on at LCU in, in California. All these universities where all the riots were, University of Tennessee had thousands of young people having their hands raised. Hundreds were baptized last week. It happened in Alabama. It's happening in different states. Now that's all not on the news, of course. That's not on the news. Only the useful idiots are shown on the news. At the same time what was going on in these Ivy League colleges, that the parents were paying hundreds of thousands of dollars for their pitiful kids to be there, for their pitiful education, with radical professors, it just goes to show you, community college may be the best way to go, and you don't owe a million dollars when you come out. Has this not been a learning experience that we see on the news? Big learning experience. Listen, we've got to have, stand firm in the liberty of Christ. We must stand firm in the Lord in our faith. Philippians 4, what we said, stand firm in the Lord, be on your guard, stand firm in the faith, be courageous, be strong. Someone has said, and I'll put it this way, doubt your doubts, believe your beliefs, don't make the mistake of believing your doubts or doubting your beliefs. And that's a little bit of a tongue twister, but I think you can do it. You've got to stand firm in the Lord and in the faith. You, you must stand firm against the devil and his schemes. How I many know he has a lot of schemes? How I many know the devil is pretty tricky? Yes. 1 Peter 5, 9 says, here's what you do. Resist him, standing firm in the faith, because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of sufferings. Stand firm. Resist him. And the Bible says he will flee. That's pretty cool, isn't it? If you resist him, he flees. Man, I like that. And then on the back of your sheet, we must stand firm in the scriptures. 2 Timothy 2.15 Paul told the Thessalonians to stand firm in their doctrines to the scriptures, to the truths of God. He says, so then, brothers and sisters, stand firm and hold fast to the teachings we passed on to you, whether by word or by mouth or by letter. Interesting. The American Bible Society released a report in 23 which states, our research confirms that millions of Christians know from personal experiences that the Bible has the power to transform their lives. The report also says it made our lives happier, healthier, and whole, flourished in every domain of human experience. How many can testify to that? Amen. We did a 5,000 distribution of scripture in a small town years ago in Tennessee where I pastored. And I, 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 was, I was so, so discouraged. I only found 100 people to help me. And somebody later said, you got a hundred people that go door to door and do stuff that like that? I, I said, yeah, I felt like I had kind of failed. Failed? A hundred people? You got a hundred people to do that? We went door to door. We had something for the children. We had testaments for the adults. We had the Proverbs for those that need philosophical understanding. We, we had all that. And the American Bible Society paid for all of it. Did this great distribution of the scriptures. We met people at their doors. We prayed with people at the door. 
And they were kind of glad we weren't Mormons or Jehovah's Witnesses. They were kind of glad for that. But we gave the scriptures out and we told and prayed with those who let us pray with them. We've got to stand firm in the scriptures. Amen? What about standing firm in a hostile world? Yeah, hello. Have you ever thought your country could become, and what's going on, could become so hostile against the things of God? It's, we're there now. No matter what we must, no matter what we must stand from in a world and a culture that harbors an insane hostility towards Christianity. I'm going to tell you, those people that are wanting Israel to go wipe off the map and go to hell, they said, they'll come against us next. Because if they hate Israel, they hate God and they hate us. Amen. The truth is, that's the way it is. Listen. Listen to what Paul says in Proverbs 10, 25. This is so cool. I feel good about this. When the storm has swept by, <laughs> the wicked, they're gone. Amen. Psalms 1. The righteous have all the advantages. The wicked are like the chaff which the wind just <laughs> blows away. I like this Proverbs passage. It's so cool. When the storm has swept by, the wicked, they're gone, but the righteous stand firm forever in the courtyard of the Lord. They will still bear fruit in old age. Hallelujah! That makes me real happy. Do you get that? Well, if you don't get it, I'm an old guy. And he says, I'm going to bear fruit in my old age. Come on. Do you understand what we're reading here? They will stay fresh and green. I feel pretty fresh this morning and green. Yeah. Proclaiming the Lord is upright. He is my rock and there is no wickedness in him. Somebody give a shout to the Lord. I know it's raining. I know we're few in number. But the Lord said in old age, we're going to bear fruit. Come on. Man, we got a bunch of old people here. I know we do. <laughs> Yeah, some of us anyway. <laughs> Notice in that scripture, he uses two metaphors, tree and rock. Oh, man. Charles Spurgeon said, we must not yield. We dare not yield. If we are of the city of the great king, the martyrs cry out to us, stand firm. The cloud of witnesses beseech to us, stand firm. The Holy Spirit helps us stand firm. The Word of God helps us stand strong. Come on. We've got to stand firm in a hostile world. And it ain't going to get any better. In fact, it's going to, I hate to say it, because I don't want to be a negative person, but I hate to say it, it's going to get a little worse before it gets any better. It's going to get better when Jesus comes. But until then, it's going to get a little worse. Now, whew, I'm worn out. We must stay cheerful as possible in all circumstances. Are you with me? Now, I know there's tragedy. Our family has experienced it. Joan's brother lost his son, 12 years old. ATV accident. I preached the funeral. At the school, the school that the public school that he went to, they let us have his service at the public school. And we lifted up Jesus that day with thousands that were there. I know there's tragedy. And sometimes there's heartache. And sometimes there's hard time. That's probably why David in verse 30 of chapter 5 said, weeping may last for a night, but joy comes in the morning. You may not be able to find joy every day in the world, and most likely you won't, but in the Lord, there's always joy. I said, in the Word, in the Word, in the Lord, there's always joy. Paul, concerning Timothy, says in Philippians 2.19, I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon. Oh, you know why he's sending Timothy? Because Paul's in jail. Paul's a prisoner. Sometimes in Rome and sometimes in house arrest. But he's a prisoner. So he says, 
I'm going to send Timothy to you soon that I may be cheered when I receive news about what's going on in the church there. Now he is incarcerated. He's in prison. He's been beaten numerous times. But he's talking about joy. He's talking about the good things of God. Listen, if Paul can do it, by the help and grace of God, we can do it. He says in Philippians 1, 3 through 5, I always pray with joy. I always pray with joy because of your fellowship in the gospel concerning the Philippian believers. In chapter 1, verse 18, I rejoice. I will continue to rejoice. We're talking about a prisoner. Philippians 2, 2, fulfill my joy. He's fulfilled his joy when he sees the Philippian believers grow in the Lord. Is what he's speaking of. Yes, verse 17 of chapter 2. And if I be offered upon the sacrifice and service of your faith, I joy and I rejoice. Verse 18 of chapter 2. For this same cause also do you joy and rejoice with me. Verse 28. When you see him again, Ephroditus, who was such a blessing from the church that came to help Paul, you may rejoice. Verse 29. Receive him in the Lord with gladness. Chapter 3, verse 1. Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. Chapter 3, verse 3. Rejoice in Christ Jesus. Have no confidence in the flesh. If you get confidence in the flesh, get rid of it. Because there's nothing good there. As verse chapter 4, verse 1. And long for and proclaim his love for the Philippian Christian. My joy and my crown. Verse 4, chapter 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. In case you missed it, rejoice, I say again. In chapter 4, verse 10. I rejoice greatly, thanksgiving, for the flipping gift of support that was given to the church in Jerusalem and to me as well. Both, they supported him. In a crazy mixed up culture and a world, the word of God declares that we can stand fast, stand firm in the power of the Spirit, in the strength of His Word, and we can do it with joy. Somebody say amen. amen. And the last little bit that had Johnny put this on the bottom, we added this after we already typed. You can't wait until life isn't hard anymore before you decide to be a joy-filled Christian. You can't wait till things get easier because it'll never, get, never happen. You gotta go ahead and just be a little crazy and rejoice right now. No matter what, whatever happens. Now, you two guys, come on up here. I need your help. I didn't want to give you too much at one time. Yeah, yeah Jerry, come on, come on. Yeah. You do this side, that's where you're sitting. You do this side, this is where you're sitting. I'm holding it. Don't yeah. these guys look like Apostle Paul guys? I barely. I think they could be. Let's see you. Do we have any moody people here? Let me see the hands of people that every now and then you find yourself a little moody. Come on, raise your hand up. Come on, don't be lying. <laughs> well, maybe only a little bit, huh? Only a little bit. Only a little bit. Go through the Bible and find all these scriptures. The word joy occurs 242 times either in the verse or the heading. The word rejoice, 177 times. The word blessed occurs 217 times. The word glad, 108 times. The word delight, 105. The word comfort, 71. The word celebrate, 68. The word enjoy, 57. The word happy, 20 times. The word cheer, 13 times. The word merry, Five times. Overjoy, five times. What that translates, there's 1,888 times the Bible talks about being cheerful. It comes almost exactly to three verses for every day of the year. Now, there's enough fear of knots for every one day of the year. Every day of the year, enough fear of knots in the Bible are equivalent of it. But here we got three of the joy for every day without repeating any of them. I tell you that you can experience 
that have nothing compared to searching out the verses that make this list. It's powerful. Memorize them. Put them on, put them on your refrigerator. Put them on a quick card where you can flash through them real quick. That'd be worthwhile. And on the back of that sheet, stand firm. And these are more scriptures in the Bible that talk about standing firm. Do not be afraid. Stand firm and you will see the deliverance of the Lord bring you today. Exodus. Then it goes on through. Stand firm without fear, Job. If you stand firm in your faith, you will not stand at all. If you do not stand firm, you will not stand at all. Isaiah 7, 9, Isaiah said that. You will be hated by everyone because of me, but the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. Stand firm and you will win life. Therefore, my beloved brothers and sisters, stand firm, let nothing move you. Always give yourself through to the work of the Lord because you know that your labor in the Lord is never in vain. Now it is God who makes both us and you stand firm in Christ. Put this where you can see it. The refrigerator is probably the best place. The book of Philippians, Paul says, serve God with joy and do it with firmness. Stand firm, stand fast in the power of the Spirit and in the power of the Lord. How many believe you can do it? Do you have enough reasons to to have joy. Is 1,088 enough reasons to walk your life and live your life in joy? Somebody say amen.